A question was posed to machine shop owners. If you could do it all again, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? What's up guys? Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool back here again for Practical Machinists. And today on Machine Shop Talk, we are going to be diving back into the Practical Machinist forums to answer a person who came on with this question and go through some of the very interesting answers that it provided. But before we do, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so today on Shop Talk, as promised, we are going to be heading back into the Practical Machinist forums, specifically the Shop Ownership and manage Management subforms. There was a very interesting thread that caught my eye um, it sounded like a fairly simple question, but the answers that it provided, I found very, very interesting. And I thought there was a lot of really good content there that I thought would be helpful to some of you guys to go through. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. Someone had come on and simply asked, machine shop owners, if you could go back to the beginning when you first started your shop, do it all again, but knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? The answers that this question got range from obviously jokes, you know, it's a community of people hanging out, there's gonna be jokes, to some very, very interesting answers. And even if you're not considering right now starting a shop, maybe you're just starting out in your career, uh, maybe you are considering starting a shop. Regardless, I feel like this is important information to have in your head kind of rolling around. So when the time comes, if you do decide to go that route, or even if you're just running a shop for somebody or you know, whatever it may be, it can help you avoid some of the headaches that these people experienced. Um, one of the best parts about these kind of communities like the Practical Machinist community is that you can go on and get advice from people that have been there that they are sharing so you can help avoid those same mistakes they made and help grow your shop faster and better. So it really is important to go through this kind of stuff when you get the chance. So the first answer to that question Knowing what you know now, what would you do differently in starting a shop? It got repeated a few times and it was a variation on, I would have bought, leased, rented, whatever it may be, the largest space that I could have right off the bat. This is something that I identify with at the moment, we'll get into that, but it's, uh, it's definitely something that I am experiencing myself. One thing that I do wanna point out with this point of advice before we get too far into it is that this kind of advice, buy the bu biggest building that I could right off the bat, has a lot of survivorship bias built into that. And what survivorship bias means is, this is advice from people who survive, not from people who fail. So the reason this information to me is kind of slanted in this direction is that one thing that I have advocated a lot for over the years making these videos, and I've seen repeated a lot on the forum, so I know I'm not the only one who repeats this kind of information, is that when you're first starting a shop, or first starting really any kind of business, you wanna stay as lean, mean, and agile as you possibly can. And a big part of that is minimizing your overhead. Obviously, if you invest in a huge building or you lease a huge space, that's gonna increase your overhead dramatically. Or at least it's going to eat up a lot of your capital. So let's say, I don't know, maybe you're super rich and you can afford to buy a $100,000, $500,000, million dollar building right off the bat. You're still eating into capital that could be used for something else. The reason why it's important to stay lean and agile off the beginning is that it allows you to pivot easily and quickly, or if you're going to fail, it allows you to fail quickly and it allows you to fail cheaply. Maybe you started a business with the aim of doing a lot of turning work. So you get some lathes in your shop and you think you're gonna do a bunch of lathe work for all the production that goes on in your area. You get started doing that, you're doing it for you know a couple months, all of a sudden you're noticing, I'm not getting a lot of RFQs for, for turning work, but I'm getting a ton of RFQs from mill work. Or maybe in my area, I thought I would be making parts, but everybody's asking me, hey, do you know somebody that can come out and repair our machines or you know who can come and do work at our plants so maybe you need to be mobile if you had a huge capital burn at the beginning investing in space or investing in whatever it may be 
that's gonna make it very difficult to fail and pivot because failing doesn't necessarily mean that you know you burn through everything you got time to shut the doors you're done fail in this context just means this is the original aim I had that aim is not where I want to go or is not what's going to work so therefore I want to turn this way and do that the more overhead you have the more the less capital you saw behind you the more difficult that can be because now you're committed to what you went to the reason that having this big space right off the bat has this survivorship bias is that when you're committed like that like i said it's very difficult to try to pivot i, I think i've repeated myself a couple times here but that's the main reason that has some survivorship bias all of that said i do still believe in this advice and I don't think it's bad advice. First of all, assuming you're not just working out of your garage, you know, a lot of shops start that way and that's a great way to start. I can't tell you how many shops online I've seen who literally it's a guy with a tiny little mill in his, uh, in his basement or in his garage and all of a sudden he builds it up and now he's going out and getting space. Assuming that now you're at the stage where you're looking to get space, industrial space can seem huge when it's empty. When you don't have a business in there, if you're going to check out units like ours, you can look at it and say, man, I can't imagine ever filling up this much space. You would be surprised how quickly space fills up. Do you want a forklift? Great, now you have to have a place to park a forklift and that's you know, 10 feet by six feet. You have to park it somewhere every night. Do you have a huge job coming in where you know there's eight skids at 12 feet long? Congratulations, you probably want that work but you need racks or you need a place to put that stuff. And if you have to drag it outside every day, that's one thing, but sometimes you may not even have room to store that stuff. Are you gonna pay for storage and drag it across town? It's a consideration. Do you have office space? You know, some guys can get by for a little bit, which is having a little computer on the floor, programming and doing all their admin work there. Very quickly, you're gonna find you need an office. You need uh, bathrooms. You need a place for people to do all the human stuff that comes with the admin work, you know, the accounting, your sales, your advertising. You need a place where people come in to check out your shop that you can take them, sit down and have a conversation. All of this eats up space very, very quickly. And one thing you'll notice guys is in that whole conversation there, not once did we talk about machines. And if you look at machines, you know, we're pretty optimized. We have three units here. so. This is kind of our biggest unit, but we have another two spaces about the same size as this, all connected in a row. We've optimized it pretty well, but it gets eaten up really quickly, you know, especially when we have to have space here to get a forklift through in order to get some stuff in and out of some machines. Um, if you have some kind of overhead crane system, you need to be able to move stuff through your shop. So now when you're putting in machines, it can get very, very tight, very, very quickly. So starting with a larger space than you think you need is going to make your life easier as you start to grow. Because there's nothing I can imagine that gives me more anxiety in life than trying to somehow pick up, rig my shop over to another place and still be in business. Because when you're moving all your stuff, and it's difficult to move machines, if you've never moved a machine, you have to hire riggers, you have to get the electrics put in, you have to get the air put in it's gonna take time to get that set up again. So moving space becomes infinitely more costly and difficult in this line of work. You wanna set it up once optimally and be done with it. But you know, that's not always the way it goes. The next piece of advice that I found on there that I did find interesting was about partners. The advice here was either be way more careful with choosing my partner when I started, or it was never have a partner ever. And I would like to say that this advice was new and novel and surprising, but unfortunately just from reading through the practical machinist forums and talking to people out there, this is kind of unsurprising and fairly well repeated. I will point out again with a lot of this kind of advice, when it comes to stuff like this, very rarely do you hear people come on to, especially something like an online forum and tell you about how good things are going. Very rarely will someone come on and say, hey, do you know what guys? I just wanted to tell you all today about me and my partner and how in our business things are going great. Because A, people don't really like reading about that because it's rarely as interesting as trying to solve a problem. And B, if it's the internet, people probably aren't gonna believe you anyway. 
So what does that leave? You leave a lot of stories of people talking about the things that are going wrong, especially with partners. So you kind of get a negative impression of it. All that aside, I do think this is extremely, extremely important advice. I do not think partnerships are bad. I do think that partnerships need to be done carefully. In some circumstances, especially when you're talking about um, starting a business and getting capital, you may need a partner to get your shop off the ground. You may not qualify for loans by yourself. You may not have the money to be able to do what you want to do. You may need to get someone else in as a partner or you know semi-investor to come in on that business with you. That said, I do think that much like romantic relationships out there, when these situations come up, people tend to wait until things are going wrong to have the really difficult conversations they should have had before they even entered into a partnership with this individual. You hear all the time, you know, oh, me and my partner, we, uh, we don't really have responsibilities, you know, we just kind of do whatever needs done and we get the, the work done around here. And then you talk to the same guy six months later and he goes, man, I'm working six, seven days a week, 12 hour days and Jim, my partner, he just sits in the office five days a week. You know, he doesn't do anything. Now, is Jim over there in the office, is he necessarily in the wrong? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe he's doing work that needs being done and he thinks that is his responsibility because they never had the discussion to say, hey, we're gonna help each other do whatever it may be. Or maybe, on the other hand, that guy is lazy. Regardless, that conversation never happened or at least is not happening, and now it's a problem. Here's the thing. It can be very, very beneficial to your company to have somebody as invested in it as you are. And no matter how good an employee may be, I still feel like you're not gonna get the same level of buy-in into a business, especially that's starting, from someone who is there to collect a paycheck. People sometimes do need skin in the game. I mean, some employees will go move head and earth to help your business grow, and if you find them, keep them. But a lot of times, people need their own skin in the game to be able to pull those long hours you may need, or come in on the Saturday, or pony up out of their bank account to make payroll. Um, you know, these are situations you don't want to find yourself in, but sometimes partners are going to be unavoidable. But if you rush into it and you're not extremely picky about who you go into business with as a partner, you can find yourself regretting that situation very quickly. And I've seen more businesses end via partnerships than, well, <laughs> mismanagement would probably be the number one, but that is a huge factor when it comes to businesses failing is poor, wrong, inappropriate partners when it comes to starting your business. The third piece of really good advice that I found there was someone said that you should, or what they would do was stop and reevaluate what we were doing earlier and do it more often. As someone who has suffered a lot over the years from not doing this enough, uh, not doing it frequently, not doing it early enough, I really identify with this information as well. It's so, so easy to get caught up in the way things are going. You know, whether that's, hey, listen, we're focusing on job shop work for the aerospace industry when really, you know, you guys should be pivoting towards the heavy equipment industry because you're getting more RFQs in there. Or maybe you haven't reprogrammed anything in 10 years because that ah, works fine. Or maybe you have all lathes, you're getting all mill work and you should be pivoting towards that. This kind of goes back to the first point we were making about being able to pivot. The best time to have stepped back and reevaluated something is three years ago. The next best time is today. Uh, you know, there's no bad time to take a minute, take a breather and think about it, but not doing it enough and not doing it early enough in your career, you can end up going down the wrong path for a long time. Maybe not the wrong path. You can end up going down a path that is not as profitable or productive or as good for your mental health or you know, it's good for your work-life balance. You can go down that road a long way if you don't stop and look, hey, listen, there was a turn back there we should have taken. Let's double back, it's gonna cost us a bit to get back there and go down that way. You can end up going down that road infinitely and get stuck somewhere where you really don't enjoy what you're doing, your business isn't profitable, um, you know, that maybe there are things in your shop that are making you miserable, that had you stopped and thought about it, you could have fixed a long time ago. I have done this so many times that it hurts. 
where you, you know, you get frustrated with the way something is laid out in your shop and guys are spending way more time walking between machines than if you had actually stopped, taking a look at what you're doing and saying, you know what, we gotta set up a cell here. Yeah, it's gonna be some work, but we can't just keep going like this. Thinking like that is gonna help you immensely if you can do it early, and especially if you're starting a shop, doing it frequently. The fourth and final responses I found interesting were the few people who wished they had been looser with their spending early on. Again, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, survivorship bias. In my opinion, there are far more shops that fail because they spend too much and commit too hard off the outset, leaving them with high overhead, um, inability to pivot and so on, rather than companies that didn't spend enough to get their shop going. That said, there's a kernel of truth here that really does ring true. One person was talking about all the money they could have saved over the years had they bought the machine when they needed it as opposed to you know, bootstrapping and just trying to get by. Another person talked about that they started their shop right after the shop they had been working at went under. And because that shop went under, you know, it kind of impacted them and they went, ah, you know what, I gotta be tight with my money otherwise I'm gonna end up like the shop I just left. That's understandable. Um, I found myself in the situation many, many times. Henry Ford, I believe it was Henry Ford, said something like, if you need a machine and you don't buy it, soon you'll find you've paid for it and you still don't have it. And I think that's very true. You know, you can get by with labor in a lot of things, you know, having a, an apprentice going and hand filing all the edges off your parts rather than investing in proper chamfer mills and the time it takes to learn to use them. Or having people tap things by hand instead of investing in a tapping arm or a tapping head. You can get by spending money on labor and time essentially, rather than investing in the machines to a point. But very quickly you'll find if you just spend the money on the things that are important when you need them, you're gonna end up saving a lot of time and money and make more money because you've done that. Uh, so I do identify with this information. Again, I think you need to be careful. That doesn't mean that if you start a shop you know, just start flashing the bills and let's go. But you do need to be able to have that capital held back so when something comes up and say, you know what, we really need this, spend the money on it, commit to it, and then go. Don't commit so hard that you're locked in there for life, but you can't be averse to spending money either. And if this sounds contradictory, it's because it is. If it was easy, everybody would do it, and every shop would be making a billion dollars a year. So is it difficult to figure out? For sure, you need to put in when I should be kind of holding back when I should be spending the money. And at the end of the day, that really comes down to experience. And like I said earlier, guys, getting to go through forums like this, you can get that experience without having to be there yourself. You know, you can separate the wheat from the chaff. This is good advice, this is bad advice, but in any case, it's always interesting. In any case, guys, I'd like to know in the comments below, uh, if you're a shop owner, I'd like to know if you could do it differently, what would you have done differently knowing what you know now if you work at a shop, what are some things you wish had been done differently off the outset? Because I feel like there's a lot of those too. And as always, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. You take care.